In the entire run of the Disney Channel, there has never been a character more disastrous than Cody Martin. Paris is full of men, and I plan on shaking my bonbons. You came here to forget that evil woman. Don't toy with me now. I'm, I'm fragile and broken. I loved Sigmund Freud. And I mean that with the utmost respect to this performance. I think Cole Sprouse added a kind of idiosyncratic energy to the character that pushed him over the edge of where he was already written, which was already a pretty severe drop. Instead of him falling over the edge, so to speak, he is catapulted. Uh -oh. A seemingly goofy character born out of a strange combination of narrative conventions who will later be revealed to be far more central to what the show is about than any character on it. This specifically flawed set of ideals paints a broader picture, but let's establish some context. So picture your me in the year 2010. You were about to watch one of the biggest television event episodes of your entire life, one that's been broadly advertised and hyped up, the season finale of The Sweet Life on Deck Season 2, The Sweet Life on Deck in Paris, it's an action-packed end to the season. Marion Mosby has just won the Tour de France. I can't believe I won the Tour de France! But all of a sudden, something is not right. You notice a sequence of events that sees Cody and Bailey, our romantic leads, more distressed and upset and devastated by a misunderstanding of their circumstance. Things get really intense and stressful. I can't believe you were stupid enough to fall for that. Just call me stupid. If the shoe fits. So sick of your competitive attitude. I'm competitive! And maybe we should just break up. Maybe we should. Is that what you want? Is that what you want? Then this happens. Ah! <laughs> and this happens. <clears throat> oh hey Cody, happy anniversary! <laughs> And that's the end of The Sweet Life on Deck Season 2. And as an adult, I didn't remember this framing device as anything but a little blip in the timeline that would set up later on Cody and Bailey getting back together, which they do and that's all that really happens between then and that point. But instead, in the wake of his breakup, in Season 3, Episode 1, Cody joins what I can only describe to be a Sigma male cult. Some of us are trying to forget women. Clarissa! And progressively propels himself more and more off the rails as the season progresses. More than I could have ever remembered. And it splatters? It's hilarious. And throughout the season, we see that frenzy of confused emotions in Cody not so much resolved. Rather, we see them change over time. And by the time The Sweet Life moves movie rolled onto Disney Channel screens all across the world, Cody Martin had deteriorated. I want to quickly outline a particular descriptive ambiguity about Cody's character. In general, he falls into a very structured, routine-oriented lifestyle, and often has spells of panic and high anxiety when things don't adhere to that specific structure, which is something I don't want to use in itself as a means to condemn Cody, or mock him in any sort of way. I've talked to people who had canon Cody as neurodivergent, and I think that's a valid and underexplored element of his character. A reading that really heightens some of the more endearing scenes of the show. I don't think that's at the root of actions that are simply of his own will and his own sense of superiority, one that is portrayed far more often, and ideological corruption that causes him to do pretty rash things. But I find it important to add that disclaimer, Okay, so we're going to start a bit further back, and to kind of get ahead of myself a little bit more, Zack and Cody kind of end up having to sort things out themselves, and they get kind of more rooted in their own misconceptions about things, as one ascends into a redemption arc and the other plummets into chaos and misery. Zack, who starts out as a genuinely unpleasant and kind of creepy guy, you really start rooting for him in the next season, and it becomes this whole duality dynamic between he and Cody. We see these unexplored parts of themselves exemplified as they make their way towards the end of the series, after years and years of these characters being on screen. But like I said, we're not there yet. In retrospect, you could argue that Maddie London and the supporting cast were the kind of interesting characters for the original, and despite Cole and Dylan being good actors in it, they mainly just convey being a little kid living around a hotel and getting into like kid mischief, and the rest of the characters kind of representing different things about class and money. Is this how all poor people sleep? I think is kind of the draw of that show. As an adult, anyways, I know that's not why they made the- And while yes, that has been my own little unnecessary hot take, I think it ties into something that makes Cody Martin's character stand out a bit more as they stumble through adolescence. With the move to On Deck, Cody's role models are few and far between. Mosby's kind of distant. Don't try and get inside Mr. Mosby's head. It's a twisted labyrinth you'll never find your way out of. 
heard someone called for a maintenance. So you can see Cody light up and get really engaged with Arwen's projects when he visits them. But now that we're all caught up, I'll just say that suffice it to say the journey of Cody Martin is not one of stability. One that's heavily centered around his view of his relationships with those around him and his view of his partner in general and how he treats her. And I think it's important before we get into that to highlight what were Cody and Bailey in the first place. Season 2 is the sizzling wick that sets off the powder keg of Season 3 Episode 1 that will set a chain reaction of explosiveness down the line of the rest of the show. And the best place to start, I think, is the two-part Castaway episode that I think very clearly represents the values of our characters being forecast long in advance to season three. I feel like putting another disclaimer here that just says these are obviously children, so like, interpret my psychoanalyzing of these scenes as more of just a detached interpretation of a written work. Okay. <laughs> Zach here gets an outlet to express his craftiness and outside-the-box mentality in a positive, constructive way, instead of messing with people out of boredom or manipulating people. I tried your fake welcome buddy thing on that girl. Guess I should have picked a dumb one like you told me, right? Oops. Bailey isn't done with everything and wants to get back to what's important to her. This isn't cramped. Cramped is when you fall into the hay baler and spend the next two weeks shaped like a box. London has essentially checked out of the show because she's 27. And Mosby and Tutwiler prove that they're OTP. Well, that's good. Not if you're waiting to see if Liam and Tamara finally get back together. Liam is so not right for me. <laughs> Heard someone called for a maintenance. Oh, and there's Cody. Cody, despite being able to conceptualize means of problem solving, often shuts himself off to the thoughts of others and opts to just do whatever he thinks is the superior method and was ultimately in his best interest. We see a kind of controlling quality that comes from his need to be the keeper of essential knowledge in the group. I'm the captain. And I say we head due west. The group unanimously agrees that Bailey is the better tracker and that she should change the course to where she thinks. I navigated my way out of a 200 acre cornfield using just the stars and the distant smell of cow patties. And Cody, instead of taking this as it is, while everyone is sleeping, he changes the direction of the sail to where he wanted to go. Did you change your course during the night? I had to do it. It's the only way we're going to find land. So you went behind my back and risked our lives just to prove a Point. And what fate befalls mutineers? <laughs> Leaving them stranded on this island where there's a dead guy. And that aspect is something that often drives a wedge between Cody and Bailey. Don't ever speak to me again. You know, we're through. <laughs> One that is repeated in many different ways over the course of this season specifically. That these are two very intelligent people who can keep up with each other, but egos often end up leading to situations less than ideal. They go from mentally sparring to taking cheap shots just like that. I think I know just a bit more about the ocean than some farm girl from landlocked Kansas. In a sense, he kind of wants to remind Bailey that she's very lucky to be dating him, when she would probably think that if he just was more genuine and kind, leaning more on his traits that she genuinely loves. I don't know how long this relationship is going to last if you're going to giggle every time I speak. Despite the direction we're going to be taking this video, this season sets up some aspects that are cute. But we also see that the bar is very low. I'll navigate my way back to civilization and bring help. It's too dangerous. I'm such a loser. No, you're not. That is the bravest and most daring thing I've ever seen any man do. Eventually they are saved by working together to get off the island. Wait. I'm taking this cardigan off. It's too hot. In general, Cody and Bailey at their best are a clingy high school couple who are visibly irritating other people around them, but have things in common that endear them to each other. But these moments are little glimpses inside of the gravel pile that is this entire relationship. And Cody starts out as a pretty wholesome partner, but over time that changes, and that's the most important part about it. Oddly enough, season two has Cody kind of on the right track. His obsession with being the apex, best at literally everything, seeps into his relationship relationship with Bailey quite a bit. Hey, if you want to take a break, it's okay with me. I don't need a break! I wish that wasn't hot tea! But the thing is, when he is like this, it creates a conflict that comes with a sense of resolution by the end of the episode. Like this episode where he wants to be the best at songwriting. Well, I'm not going to sell out! You won't sell anything! This from the brilliant mind behind Retainer Baby. Hit it. <laughs> Wait, you liked it? Yeah, I like the hook and the beat. You made it better. Or a more frustrating instance of this where he wants to make Bailey jealous. I'll go get you some ice water. Do you want anything? Oh, how sweet. Uh, no thanks. I apologize for Bailey's behavior. 
crazed with jealousy. Because a model friend he knew when he was like 10 is on the boat. Girls, 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 stop it! Stop! You need to trust that I'll be faithful no matter how many girls throw themselves at me, as again, I'm the total package. It goes on until the situation he's contrived in his head plays out where Bailey takes a dominant stance while he can still be an aloof boy. Stay away from my boyfriend! <laughs> Good, good. Do you think he pulls it? <laughs> Cody's often far more concerned with posturing in a situation than actually doing anything constructive. But by the end of the episode, he usually comes around and makes amends or something like that, which in itself is fine and a way of making a complete story within each episode and can show kind of growth from Cody maybe eventually. But the way season three takes it, takes all of this stuff and forces you to zoom out. And this is kind of our mild start for the first half of the second season. One continuous strain of Han conflicts that are all very similar, which sounds like I'm skipping a lot of episodes, but the second half of this season is when things really start to kick off. So before that, I wanted to do an important, quick, mid-season check-in. To incorporate a bit of Sweet Life lore into our look at Cody, well, yes, for a lot of the time, Cody was the archetypical nerd character. He was kind of a genius in his youth, having literally invented a jetpack for some random science project. But Cody's amazing, beyond gifted inventions will kind of be something that is never really replicated in the sweet life on deck. Nothing that matches this level of inventive serendipity, where Cody has an opportunity to hone his craft until this moment where London offers the gang a million dollars to come up with an invention to complete her girl boss arc. And the result is this robot, this horrific, malicious mechanic megalomaniac of Cody's creation, and we watch as this uncanny, mechanically divined thing breaks down and wreaks havoc, targeting Mosby and trying to boil him and eat him. Must make soup. You can tell this is the culmination of mainly Cody's efforts. I mean, who else canonically could make this? But it has enough of his instability, the mark of scatterbrained genius, to feel emblematic of his state of mind at the time. She can take out 12 city blocks using rocket launchers and a high-intensity microwave pulse. So I also want to check in with Zack. You'll notice we have kind of been carving around the Zack storylines as they're kind of separated from the Cody storylines more frequently in this season. And they all follow a similar formula. Zack contrives a situation to trick someone into dating him. It doesn't go as he expected and that's about it. But this season feels designed to impart a kind of reversal of perspective. Zack sees the other side of his objectifying ways and has the script flipped on him multiple times. All the girls will send in a photo and an application, making it easy to weed out the ones not worth pursuing. Cancel the whole thing, and they'll never even know we were involved. Oh, come on. We didn't even have a swimsuit competition. Maybe we should have one now. It's like we're pieces of meat and just gets put in uncomfortable situations. Not that he deserved to be in them in the first place any more than these people do, but it would seem these moments potentially gave him a bit of perspective. Perspective that takes time to go into effect, manifesting first in defensiveness, fortifying himself behind an overcompensation. I mean, in one of the series' most entertaining episodes, Zack is retooled into a parody of misogynistic news anchors. You might wanna put a little lipstick on that kisser. Give the male viewer some eye candy. Get me some more hot chocolate with six marshmallows. <laughs> Has Kirby given any indication of how he plans on knocking? Will he use some sort of knocking stick? <laughs> knocking stick? There's no such thing. <laughs> But I think he eventually reworked that negative energy in season three, seeing Cody's approach to masculinity undermining all of his once likable and innocent traits. A kind of pitiful, fallen character. Eventually, she will be sorry. He learns that being aware of how you view relationships and trying to be better about that isn't something that breeds inadequacy, in fact, it's the opposite. Because the opposite of empathy is just what Cody is exhibiting and leading him down a spiral of bitterness. Whenever a girl asks you a question, just say six. When dealing with women, it's the perfect answer to any of their questions. Why? What dress size do you think I am? Six. How many girls have you dated? Six. Leading Zach to realize that he doesn't want to end up like that. More on that later. So Marriage 101 is where things start to change noticeably, like extremely noticeably. Miss Tutwiler assigns the class a project where they choose partners for a marriage simulation. What? No one wants to marry me? You get used to it. And of course, Cody and Bailey pair up and take it way too seriously. Isn't it, Bailey Bunny? It sure is, Cody Kitten. <laughs> <laughs> you two should be spayed and neutered. Tutwiler throws in a randomizer later in the episode. Wheel! You get used to it. I heard someone called for a maintenance. That reveals that Cody's legs will be broken and Zack will become a clown. 
in the role play scenario, not she doesn't break their legs. We see Cody and Cass with pretend injuries just lying there, groaning demands at Bailey, and being just genuinely insulting overall. Later on, they do a kind of 70s game show meetup where they reveal what they've learned, and much to my delight, Zach shows up full clown and is just committed to the clown bit just to like goof around and be weird about it. <laughs> it kind of shows another side to him that isn't just all about being the cool guy, but that's for season three. But in this episode, Cody and Bailey break up for the second time this season after Cody just is an absolute jerk. I'm sick of doing everything while you sit there whining and criticizing. <laughs> I wouldn't have to criticize you if you did things right. If this is how you're going to treat me when we're really married, then I don't think we have a future. I agree. Bailey's kind of just had enough of it. They snipe at each other and Bailey raises a really good point. Thank you, Miss Tawila, for saving me from wasting my life with the black hole of need. Zach would continue to be a creepy misogynist for the rest of season two, branding his phone number onto the heads of people he's talking to with an ink stamp, but eventually it would come out stronger and just better and a more lush and fulfilled person. And while after this dating show episode, Cody would have a couple more moments of being chill, well, I mean in the marriage episode we see Cody and Bailey reach a kind of resolution once again, but it becomes much harder to explain away. Tutwiler gives a kind of nebulous explanation that relationships have to be bad a lot of the time for them to work out in the end. Relationships are about compromise. I mean, don't let this little disagreement break you up. Give and take, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health. Tutwiler is definitely written to be an authority on relationships, and if they actually recovered from this episode, that would be one thing, but we're like two episodes away from that not happening because this is basically the end of season two in terms of plot. Basically. We're at a part of the video where things are about to change, so. For context, Disney Channel shows had a habit of pulling the rug out from under you when you least expect it with these kind of gut punch moments. Say goodbye to your life. Likely as a means to peak viewer engagement, they would throw in these storylines with really intense things happening just out of nowhere. I'll never stop loving you! Oh my gosh! This would be a good segue into the Wizards of Waverly Place Hannah Montana crossover episode with the Sweet Life on deck that took place in this show. But um, Ugh. but as this massive two-part event starts, it's Cody and Bailey's anniversary, and they're preparing in separate parts of Paris. Tomorrow, I'm going to be here with someone I care about. Thank you. Bailey is working on a painting of her and Cody, and Cody is on a practice date with London to make sure everything is good. And to be fair, he somehow books a table on top of the Eiffel Tower. But meanwhile, a creepy, horny guy pesters Bailey, and Bailey makes it very clear that she's not interested. She ends up going to the Eiffel Tower and sees Cody in London there, not knowing it's London, practicing on this date. Bailey obviously gets the wrong idea and leaves without letting Cody know what she thinks. So? She ends up standing Cody up the next day and cries with this French guy who is the creepy guy after he kind of manipulates her. What is wrong, mon chéri? I saw Cody kissing another girl. That is awful! <laughs> and then of course there's the very end where we have the big conflicts we kind of teased before. Mosby wins the Tour de France by accidentally being thrown into the race because they confuse his cosplay for being an actual cyclist. But like, this made me so upset rewatching it even, like she's not even in the shot and like it's obvious that they did this so that they somehow wouldn't see each other. But it works as being the most stressful ending to their relationship, one that was long overdue. Despite Bailey coming up and like saying that it was all a misunderstanding and that there was nothing going on, Cody snaps and My girlfriend doesn't trust me, yay! I kind of get why he's upset because he put all this effort into this by booking the Eiffel Tower somehow, but he's really creepy about his way of explaining this. He cites not being quote unfaithful to her before they even started dating as he was obsessing over her with his six month plan to get her to date him. Even though I've been completely faithful to you for an entire year, not to mention during my six month plan, even though you didn't even know I existed. And that's the end of Bailey and Cody for now. Now at the end of season two, things are just sadder than they have ever been. Now nothing will be the same. Well, this is where I come to cry, too. So in season three, episode one, Cody goes missing, and we find out he joined a cult to escape the Bailey. I hope he's out there somewhere letting his hair down. And just the idea of women in general. I have sworn off girls forever and gone to live out the rest of my days with the brotherhood of the hooded brothers. Wow. I know. Think about what this means. He is bald and robe-clad and miserable. They tell Mr. Mosby that we're stranded on this island. 
You see a pent-up rage bursting out from behind his self-proclaimed soft demeanor. His emotional confusion and inability to see his actions and his situation for what they are, Cody being preyed on by this weird group of grown men who want to indoctrinate him into their misogynistic cult. Let your mind be cleared of her through hard work. Honestly, a direction I was not immediately picturing after season two. It's really sad and upsetting and eerie to see Cody reach such a low, such a brutal low, not even by his own merits so much, but in that an adult saw a vulnerability in him, an emotional instability, and exploited that. <laughs> Zack and Woody come to the islands to get Cody to write a paper on War and Peace for them, but it isn't just fun and games. I'm afraid brother Cody is unavailable. They confiscated my phone. It's them trying to get Cody to take the bait as he's wailing and just without any sense of identity left in him. Look, I know you're in pain over your breakup with Bailey. Who wouldn't be? You've got your whole life to live. Cody learns how a cult operates because Zack deprograms him. There's a big world out there filled with awesome experiences, but you can't have any of them if you're just stuck here on this island with a bunch of weird bald dudes. <laughs> Zack, I appreciate that. My brothers, these aren't your brothers. I'm your brother. I care about you. Resolutions that balance the story to where Cody was at a neutral place. <laughs> Good thing I used a bald cap and didn't actually shave my head. But that is in no way to imply that the circular conflict resolution has solved anything. Cody's kind of flippant way of dealing with this major life event, and the way he positions himself in the right in most interactions, is a sign of the direction that this show will be taking. Bailey and Cody go to a non-refundable trip to a chocolate factory as exes. If you're not mature enough to go as friends, I'll just take the tickets. Uh, mature? Uh, please. There's a somehow hornier parody of Willy Wonka. Their whole trip is like this weird thing that's meant to be romantic, and they just are not vibing in it. <sighs> Your turn. I mean, obviously. Bailey and Cody are stressed out by the situation, and then Woody shows up and wanders around being wholesome, and it creates confusion. That's all you're writing? I saw hers and it says, I love and miss you with all my heart. I can't believe she wants me back. I know, why would she want you back? The chocolate guy starts thirsting after him and oh, pretending chocolate. he's chocolate. <laughs> and then Cody just goes way too far. I never stop loving you. I don't know what to say, Cody. Let your heart speak for you. Uh, it made my heart for my dad. <laughs> what? Bailey makes it clear she has zero interest in playing into this. <laughs> We were just friends. Woody! Ah! You broke my heart! You broke mine first! Zack pulls off this big party, admittedly by scheming. London doesn't seem very sporty. She fell in love with baseball the second she found out they play on a diamond. Surprise! A new love interest, Maya, shows up. He is probably just surprised that she showed up. She hates you. She does? Why? Uh, she just hates everything about you. Don't be sad. He but Maya ends up getting together with Zack after she lets him know that he doesn't have to lie about stuff like that. She didn't care if it was London's party or not. I know you're probably mad at me right now. I'm not mad. You're not? No guy has ever gone to this much trouble for my birthday before. And you're a great girl, Maya, and uh, you deserve the best. Which is exactly what I have. She just wanted to spend time with him and have him be honest and genuine with her. And this is Zack's first opportunity to demonstrate his direction for the season. Will he try to manipulate someone or will he start to actually take their feelings into account? And the answer is, he's getting there. That's that whole thing set up. And we can now talk about Season 3, Episode 9, Love and War. There's a slightly recurring device in Season 3 where Cody gives Zack advice about relationships, whether solicited or otherwise. It looks like she just updated her status to in a relationship. Yeah, she's really into me. Can you blame her? No. <laughs> the advice Cody gives in this episode is deranged and the sincerity it's delivered with makes it all the more strange. You gotta change your status too. And well, your whole life. <laughs> Bailey made me join her stupid quilting circle. You were in that before she was. Whatever. Actually, didn't you start the quilting circle? <laughs> Eventually, Cody gets in his head and Zack finds himself with a crisis on his hand. I've been invited to read one of my poems at Poet Palooza! Fantastic! It's tomorrow night at the Sky Deck at 8. See you there. Just for tomorrow at 8. <laughs> Will he attend the poetry night of Maya or stick to the plans that he had for a long time that are just as important to him? Is 8 o'clock a hard start or could we start a little later? What? You know we can't change the time. What are you... Wait a minute. 
Wait a minute. Out of fear, she'll be upset with him. He just goes back and forth between the esports gaming match and the recital. I am here for you. Got a tinkle. <laughs> Cody relishes in this relationship-based conflict as it affirms a kind of sense of rightness about relationships in general. She asked you to change something, didn't she? No. He wants nothing more than some kind of crisis to happen and to fall out. Zach, what's going on? He just led us to supreme invader status! I was thinking of changing my status too! Back to single! To be the gatekeeper of knowledge once again. I'm the captain and the guys needed me! Why didn't you just tell me that? Why didn't you just tell her? Maya finds out and she's just actually understanding and accepting about Zach's own right to his activities. I'm not saying there won't be times when I want you to myself. Just because we're in a relationship doesn't mean I expect you to give up your friends. You like me for me and I don't have to change. Your shirt once in a while. This episode shows a kind of progression that Cody was hoping things were headed for him having the upper hand by being as right about everything as he thinks he is, but we see that Zach has reached a kind of understanding about healthy relationships and Cody is still stuck in a bitterness formed around his codependency. The title of this episode itself is a callback to one of the biggest romantic conflicts in the Sweet Life of Zach and Cody show. But Zach already has dibs. Okay, look, you can't dib a human being, especially a woman who is your equal in every way. And... All's fair in love and war. Except no hitting. I feel weird uttering the phrase romantic conflicts about this show since it's about 11 year olds and that's part of the reason why I find it weird rewatching it. Needless to say, while Zach has a lot of unlearning to do, Cody also has to unlearn a lot, a lot of which he learned from Zach himself. <laughs> do you remember any of our previous discussions about my lack of self esteem and your lack of support? For instance, in this episode, Cody kind of just takes not only Zach's advice, but the advice he feels Zach probably would give him. So. Be me. Be the bad boy. Don't ask sissy out. Tell her you're going out. <sighs> okay. <laughs> you're right. A kind of looming stream of thought, and to the extent that Cody digs his heels in and cannot accept change, it creates a proportionately sized hill for him to die on. We've reached an episode in season 3 where something different is happening. We see Cody's delusions of grandeur being played into by someone who can give him a position of power, specifically Miss Tutwiler. Cody! 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 Now class, for your final drama assignment, everyone will participate in the production of Cody's play. No! What? No! After assigning the class to write their own stage plays, she attaches herself to Cody's script. A script that in itself is a thinly veiled vent session about his relationship with Bailey. This this play is a thinly veiled portrayal of my breakup with Cody. Wow, ego alert. Haley Chainlink is nothing like Bailey Pickett. And Miss Tutwiler gravitates towards this because she's set up as loving, trashy romance stories. Come to mama. Paris, 1940. The German invasion of Paris? Well, as a backdrop to an even larger calamity. The heartbreak of the young, handsome, intelligent Brody. Miss Tutwiler is the only person who ever plays into this stuff with their relationship, and she's the most unreliable person to set up for that. But she fully endorses it despite the concerns of the rest of the class and makes them put on a production of it, putting Cody's perspective on a pedestal and inflating his ego to full capacity. Too bad she can't bring that intensity to the performance. <laughs> now why don't you get back up on stage and shake your bonbons? This is Cody at his genuine worst, his most spiteful, his most controlling, leading to Bailey rightfully quitting despite Tutwiler's threat of of failing her class because of it. You know what? No! I refuse to do this piece of trash! I quit! And I'm taking my bonbons with me! And it gets even worse. Cody himself decides to portray Bailey in a way that makes the writing feel even more mean-spirited through this performance that is just an awful caricature of her. We're going to be together forever and ever! Or so he thinks! Paris is full of men, and I plan on shaking my bonbons for each and every one of them. This is the worst play I've ever seen. We're through. I have lost the best thing that's ever happened to me. I can't believe you hate me so much that you killed me off. Well, at least she stayed to the end. Most people ran off crying during the first- And we, for the first time in a while, get a moment where Cody tries to own up to what he's done. And we realize how far off we've gotten from season two. You know, maybe that night on top of the Eiffel Tower, maybe I'm just as much to blame. Then fix it. <laughs> Go apologize and get her back. You're right. I'm not gonna waste another minute. But what Cody has done overall has gone so far that Bailey is just done with him completely. Look, Bailey, I'm really sorry. Because I was just thinking the two of us should- Never speak to each other again? I agree. You two should split the lobster.
He wrote an entire play for the entire class to see about how horrible she is and made them all play a part in it. And to those who haven't watched the show, you're thinking, you said that, they get back together, but I don't believe you anymore. And that's valid, but they do, so. <laughs> so how do we get there? Well, the next part of the story is a resolution that is three parts long. It's actually an arc that lasts three episodes that are all called the same thing. It's breakup in Paris, but one more part long. And it's such a, it's a lot of content to describe. Okay, but I can't put this off any longer. <laughs> It's a lot of ground to cover. It's an exhausting series of episodes. <laughs> the three-part arc that reunites Cody and Bailey is something that genuinely shook me to my very core and made me confused beyond my wildest memories of it. The first part is kind of as follows. Bailey and London are heading back to Bailey's hometown, Kettlecorn, Kansas, and the vibe is light, fluffy comedy, but it's kind of eerie. Meanwhile, on the ship, Mr. Mosby's brother shows up, who is NBA player Dwight Howard, and that's, like, funny, I guess. This episode's a lot of just stuff. Honestly, this episode might as well not be the first part. It's just kind of like unrelated except for Bailey and London being in Kansas. Did you hear from Bailey? No, she's gone for good. But something really important does in fact happen. Bailey pranks London, but then that atmosphere of the scene creeps over the lighthearted tone with his billowing wind until you realize that there isn't any more laughter oh happening. God, like... And then this happens. This masked figure leaps onto the truck and, instead of doing anything, just instantly passes out, just laying there. Things have gone absolutely wild, and this horrified me. Bailey phones Cody for help, the call cuts out. Are you there? Hello? And we cut to this tease of the next episode that ends with this harrowing goliath of a twister. And yeah, this really scared me as a child, and I kind of forgot about this entire sequence until I rewatched it. And it scared me just as much now, um. <laughs> and it's mostly because it comes at the most unassuming moment in the show, which is once again the way that Disney Channel likes to do it. Oh my gosh! And that's the cliffhanger for part two, and part two is interesting. <laughs> in part two they get out of the truck and the masked person has deflated into this creepy face. And they're just like, oh, it's a scarecrow that blew into the windshield. <gasps> it's not the corn goblin, it's just a scarecrow. <gasps> The wind must have blown it over from the cornfield last night. And I was like, that can't be actually what happened. And I look it up on the Sweet Life Wiki, and of course, that's what it says. But, um, are you sure, ma'am? <laughs> I know this is a tangent, but the Corn Goblin's existence is something that a whole episode is devoted to our characters questioning, and so we as an audience do the same. Bailey, you can't just leave me here! What about the Corn Goblin? You better not let the Corn Goblin hear you say that. I know there's no such thing as a Corn Goblin. Legend has it, he roams the countryside, reaping revenge on those who hate corn. So if I had to theorize, I would say that the Corn Goblin that has been mythologized is exactly what they ran into. It's possible that the Corn Goblin dematerializes or sheds its deflated skin and leaves the Scarecrow behind. It's not far out of the realm of possibility of this show, and it takes place within the same universe as the Wizards of Waverly Place. That's another thing. <laughs> we literally see this as a person jumping onto the car. And someone might say like, oh, that's just their vision of it because they're afraid it's dark. That's what they think they're seeing. So we as an audience see that too as a representation of that. But to that I say we can hear like a deep grunting sound over the phone on Cody's end. So really? So I think this proves the existence of the Corn Goblin. That is all I have to say on the matter. But it causes Cody to feel extremely worried, and that makes sense. Cody makes his way there and starts to help after having an awkward interaction with Bailey's parents. What can I do you for? Uh, hi there, Mr. Pickett. I'm Cody, Bailey's friend from the... D then Bailey's ex from season one shows up. But there's a moment that's kind of atmospherically equivalent for Bailey and Cody's relationship. After Cody has tried to kind of perform hypermasculinity. Trick is having muscles, son. <laughs> Bailey finds it annoying, and they start to talk, and Cody tries to just be honest for a second. Now in case you haven't noticed, I'm a little out of my element here. And I'm also very nervous because- It's this moment where he kind of tries to bear what he actually feels and what is beneath that horrible facade that keeps emerging. Cody has his whole outpouring coming on, but right as that's happening, the wind starts to pick up. What? And then they see it's a tornado, and Cody starts to panic and runs into the cellar. 
But in general, the tornado part is a moment where Cody wears his flaws with full honesty and Bailey finds something endearing about it. It's his first twister! It's certainly more emblematic of his true character. It harkens back to the moments where he hasn't been trying to pull off an external front of being all together. I think that's what Bailey likes about Cody, that that's just who he is behind all of that. That crown does not belong to you! Yeah, you tell him, baby! But unfortunately, he's also just really inconsiderate. And it becomes this kind of stressful tug of war between Cody and Moose over who has the right to be with Bailey. Sorry, sweetie. The point is that you're my girl and you always will be. Which ends with Bailey being pushed into a wooden plank and being knocked unconscious. She belongs with me! She belongs with me! Really? Oh. Oh. There's a dream sequence that takes place in Oz with Moose as the Scarecrow and Cody as the Tin Man who says this. Three to one, you're coming with me! Uh, it is her decision. I think, since you're lucky enough to have a heart, you should follow it. You know what? You're right, Tin Man. I think you should follow your heart. You know what? You're absolutely right. And Bailey ultimately wakes up and does in fact make a choice. My heart belongs with Cody. It does? Keep in mind we still have an entire part episode to go, and Cody and Bailey are already back together and it's all based on something Cody said to her in a dream. And not like through dream travel like in Wizards of Waverly Place, but like something Bailey's brain just made up while she was sleeping. The last part episode is dedicated to Cody winning the favor of Bailey's family and kind of redeeming himself, but this all feels like it came out of order. Instead of Bailey saying this isn't the time to pressure me into being in a relationship, my childhood home is being destroyed and we're trapped in the cellar with my parents and elderly grandmother, and then having Cody prove that he's there to support her instead of selfishly trying to win her favor. I'll help. I'll help too. Uh, we can stay a few extra days. With Cody having to realize that she doesn't have to make the choice right there and then, and then just helping her and being a good friend to her. It's times like this you know who your real friends are. Thanks, guys. You tried your darndest to save my farm, and I can't think of anyone better. Then they get back together after that. Are you gonna kiss her? Or are we gonna have to wait six months again? <laughs> Which would have been perfect, they had all the pieces right there. She just kind of is compliant and then the rest happens. Bailey has to make the right choice to let Cody be in her life as a partner and then he will help her and it's kind of like a toxic way of looking at it, I think. Zach, Woody, and Mosby ship out with an army unit to get to Kettlecorn to show their support. Cody, Bailey, and London are in Kettlecorn. I hope they're okay. They're not letting anyone through? No, but the government is sending in a search and rescue unit. London's dad gets involved, buys their land, and wants to develop. London gets in the way. I like the way they depict Mr. Tipton. You can't stop me. Trust me, Daddy, you do not want to make an enemy of me. I'll tell them about the money laundering, the payoffs, the secret mining operation on the moon. But yeah, they kind of just get back together, and it's some Alex and Mason bullshit, which is a hot take that I'm not going to back up here, because that's as much as Cody and Bailey's relationship develops in the next few episodes. Um... There's an episode where the writers just throw in that Bailey's never once genuinely laughed at Cody's jokes, which takes away the only endearing part of their relationship, which is that they're just dorky together. But you've laughed at my jokes lots of times. Yeah, the thing is, I was faking it. But yeah, that's about it for now. But that doesn't mean that nothing happens in this time, because the finale is pretty massive. Like I said, the last few episodes before the finale, after this massive three-part saga, feels pretty chill. It's very akin to the Michael Scott paper company arc being the defining factor of that season of The Office, and then the end episodes of that season just being kind of like, whatever. There's some kind of like standardly fluffy plot lines, that's about the most that happens. So how do they get us with another Disney gut punch? Come on, buddy. So right off the bat, the SS Tipton has apparently been sold by Mr. Tipton. Seems the ship has been sold. And will be ripped apart by the end of this episode. We reach New York, and the ship is dismantled. Excuse me! In addition to that stress, we have Maya and Zach's relationship kind of being brought into question as Maya wants to join the Peace Corps seemingly out of nowhere. We call each other. Cell phone service in Africa can be a little spotty. And Zach is questioning whether or not he wants to break up with her. And Cody somehow doesn't get into Yale. There's always Princeton. <laughs> the armpit of the Ivy League. Zach eventually decides he can't go through with breaking up with Maya because he loves her, or at least wants to see things through. And Maya just ends up breaking up with Zach. Are you breaking up with me? And that's totally reasonable. Yeah. I just don't think that this long distance relationship thing is fair for either one of us. Zach kind of then flips out. No, no, we can still be friends. No, don't touch me. I'm so sorry. 
but it comes from a place where he's going back to his old ways of processing things. And I, I can't believe I wasted the best three months of my life on you! No, baby, don't say that. I'm not your baby anymore. He realizes that he's at a different place now, and eventually he sees what he could be. I went on the road with my band, and I've done just fine. I don't want to be the creepy old dude hitting on waitresses and filthy truck stops. Also, I love Maya's, like, respectful and reasonable response to Zack and Cody's parents. Oh, by the way, I'm Maya. I'm so sorry, and I will not be there for Thanksgiving. Zack and Cody both end up going to graduation after planning not to. Hi. Please excuse my wrinkly robe. Mr. Mosby stands up to Mr. Tipton. I'll handle this. Mr. Tipton wants the ship stripped down within the hour. But your daughter is one of the graduates. We are having this graduation ceremony, whether you like it or not. And the conclusion is just genuinely heartwarming. Those being taught why they get engaged. Emma. Tutwiler is negatively coded as like a spinster type character, which honestly just makes her more likable to me, like when she gets smashed at this chess game when she's supposed to be commentating because she's bored. The myriad ramifications of his opponent's every move. Man, I gotta pee. Oh, I have kittens, and they all love yarn. No one cares. <laughs> but now the whole world knows you're a lonely cat lady. And everyone's saying goodbye, which is normal. The gut punch was there, but things kind of are smoothing out now. You deserve to go to Yale. Yale won't be the same without you. None of us out here are going to Yale. But there's a kind of air of uncertainty going on. Like, they know that once they get off the ship, they have more stuff to sort out, and we know that. Promise you'll come visit me at Yale? I promise. I got an admissions guy I want to talk to. <laughs> there's some foreshadowing here because we're not done. What's next? I don't know. There's something really weird about the Sweet Life movie, a weird in a way that's different from the TV show. The plot of the movie surrounds Cody. He takes an internship to try to get into Yale. Zach gets him fired from the internship. I hate you. We may be twins, but we are not brothers. My brother. She'll never be my friend. And since he feels bad about how it makes Cody feel, he tries to set him up with a new internship to make things right. A project that's pitched to Cody with the specific goal to analyze his psyche and mind. It's an isolated science camp, doing research similar to ours, but on twins. I'm a twin! But he finds out that it isn't just him, and Zach has to go with him, so Zach and Cody both end up going together. Well, I sent your application paper to the scientist who runs it. Dr. Olson. And this sounds eerily more and more like the video I've been writing. Cody then uses this exercise from the experiment to electric shock Zach. He administers a small shock. Wait, what? Ow, ow, ow. Oh, very disappointing. That he says this to him. Let's get one thing straight. We will never be even. She'll never be my friend. There's a subplot where since London ate this experimental food that's meant to be for a dolphin to reroute his brain with an empathy gland or whatever. You ate the Corsican fruit and now you can hear the dolphin. She can now talk to animals. Oh, they're in the mountains about 50 miles from- You can understand the dolphins? Yep. Their whole thing is that Bailey is mad and Woody and London are just hanging out with her and they're trying to have a good time. But if you two could just communicate- You know what? After this moment, I am done talking about Cody. Ugh, works for me. I am in. It almost felt like a fourth wall break that was talking directly to me. I am in. Great. So you know how I said that there was that episode of Cody being in a cult? I see that you are moved by the story of our founder, Brother Cornelius, and his legendary battle with the phone company. Um... Well, this movie's kind of also about Cody joining a cult, and it's done in a way that's more viscerally representative of what a cult is like than anything the show has done. Besides, once the merge happens, everything will feel right to you. The merge? Cody doesn't need anyone but Cody. You're wrong. You'll see. The merge will fix everything. Everyone there seems coaxed into a state of compliance. Their communication with the outside world is cut off. Wouldn't want to risk a malfunction. They're fed this weird brainwashy thing, and this isn't even like my hyperbolic reading of it. Second Cody may be in danger. No. It could be a matter of life or death. Call Mr. Mosby. Tell him to meet us at the Gemini Project on the new old Sawmill Road. It's revealed later on that this guy was the unsuccessful twin of the internship guy from the start wearing a suit. And is starting a militia of evil twins, so... It is literally just a cult that's meant to recruit people. Everyone there is programmed to create an air of grandeur surrounding the main scientist. Kelly and I used to fight 
But through the noble work Dr. Olsen is doing, we learn how to get along. Most importantly to us, Cody feels an immense sense of belonging there, and it's a trait that's exploited and manipulated. Oh. Shh. Baby, don't speak. I'm sorry, Cody. You're of no use to me. But before that, Bailey basically decides that she's going to dump Cody again because he's gone no contact since there's no phones there and he's totally bought into this cult. I really need to call my girlfriend. It's impossible. But she ends up not doing it. I guess this leads to the truth being that at this point, Cody isn't so much being radicalized into being a misogynist. He externalizes his regret to the way he's treated his partners in what he believes might be his last words. Tell Bailey that I respect her as a woman. No. Okay. More so, Cody seems relatively depressed about his current circumstances, about a future that seemed so bright being much more draining and complicated than he expected. And now he has to do this internship where he's in a cult and he's just doing whatever he can. Fine. You know, if you hadn't completely messed up my internship with Dr. Spaulding. Because this cult feels like a way for him to fast track to where he wants to be. His flawed ideals are kind of brought into question more in this movie than as are Zach's. I mean, the entire plot mechanic of the movie is a device that makes Zach and Cody feel empathy towards each other and to other people. Where there's more empathy between people, there's less conflict. If we could connect with each other's minds, we'd actually be able to feel what others feel. This is my mind transference facilitator. My goal is to use it to perfect communication between humans. <laughs> not only are you gonna break my spirit, but you're gonna mock me as well. I'm not mocking you. I'm, I'm f feeling empathy. It's not good that they got inducted into this cult, obviously. What I'm saying is that there was a conscious effort to make Zack and Cody somehow grow out of what they had set up in the past. You said my hamster Sigmund Freud I loved Sigmund Freud. Mommy and I bonded over him. It's like I mentioned earlier, Zach realizing who he wants to be is a crucial part of his development. Cody, you know what you want to do with your life. So does Bailey. Even London knows exactly who she is. I'm the only one who doesn't. And I know that somewhere out there, I'm great at something. I just need to find it. Of course, the empathy devices are then used to funnel into the doctor. A kind of egocentric, one-sided thing where everyone acts as his puppets. Are you leaving? More escaping. Can we go for a walk first? I can't. After you. It's hard to be a twin, huh? Now he convinced me I should stay. Their own input doesn't really matter outside of his own goals. It feels weird, like it's some radical coincidence that these things are in there, but it's all right there. Cody and Zack end up trying to escape, but are pursued by the cult guy. We find out he wants to merge their brains because their collective strengths feed into one another and cancel out their weaknesses. This is when he reveals that he was the twin of the internship guy. My evil twin brother. And was thrown out of the scientific community. The scientific community threw him out. Damn. I hope I don't get thrown out of the LGBTQ plus community for liking the office like straight people. Fruit. He also reveals that he was following them with a variety of latex masks disguising himself. Paris is full of men. It's for each and every one. Zach and Cody battle over whose brain will consume both of their consciousnesses, and that causes the machine to just blow up. Zach and Cody then go, you could use empathy as a really powerful tool to just try to get to the bottom of what someone else is feeling and learn from it. You were always jealous of me. You had everything. True. I'm gonna end with something that was definitely unintentional just to round off how intentional this movie feels. The last joke feels kind of reminiscent of an arc. Cody mentions he and Bailey are getting on just fine and remarks about visiting a giant ball of twine. What was your favorite? Well, it's a toss up between the erosional granite sandstone sea cave and that giant ball of twine. <laughs> We see as he walks off screen a long stretch of twine sucked to the inside of his shoe. That his messy tangled ball of emotions and thoughts and uncertainties have been kind of resolved. The Sweet Life movie strangely and unexpectedly rounds off my entire viewing experience of The Sweet Life on deck in a way that I wasn't expecting. This weird kid sitcom was about the radicalization and development of Cody Martin this whole time. And that's just something that I wasn't expecting it to actually be consciously working towards. Okay, let me just... Hello again. It's been three months since I filmed the first part of this video, and not much has changed. I've been watching a lot of gay shows and crying, and I kind of look a bit different now. Not by much, honestly. <laughs> Thank you.
Upon editing the three-part kettle corn arc, I was so comfortable in my assertion of the genuine corn goblin incarnate that I never considered an alternative to that. The show was filled with these kind of supernatural occurrences, that's just the truth of it. Like I said, it... Like I said, but there was something different about this instance, that its inclusion was so pivotal in launching an arc forward, being the catalyst for Cody venturing to Kettle Corn, and in turn for altering Bailey's imminent decision that she was fated to make. And then as I was revising and restructuring this section, I had a thought that it's entirely possible that the Corn Goblin is like a person, and I kind of just dismissed the thought at first. There's no real way of speculating whether or not this is true. It's not really set up in any capacity or any notion of an investigation into the Corn Goblin goblin being a concrete incident. But then out of nowhere I landed on something and followed that lead until I- it's Moose. Moose is the corn goblin, um, probably, if it's a person. Let me set the stage. Bailey Pickett decides to leave her hometown Kettle Corn, Kansas after Grammy Pickett takes a turn. She is intercepted by something horrifying on her way there. Then she finds out it's a scarecrow. She starts to doubt herself. She's shaken. Who then shows up to comfort her? This sturdy farm boy. Who Let me just relinquish any notion of bias because I went into this episode liking Cody less than Moose. Or maybe not, I don't know. I didn't like either of them. But the more I zoom out, the more my feelings towards Moose sour. Long before the show decided to corrupt Cody Martin, Moose's presence within the singular story he was in presented him as a kind of charming but careless and kind of oafish guy to Cody's like archetypical nice guy. I don't know how to thank you. Whoa. They at first employed this trope in him pretty flatly to make him the more likable figure in the story, but eventually we saw how it turned out. Okay, I don't need to recap all of it. <laughs> But one of the biggest takeaways we see from their interaction is that Moose is someone who carries himself very effectively and intentionally. He sizes Cody up after he finds out he threw this party for Bailey for an unnaturally long amount of time. I hear you planned this party for my Bailey. No, no, uh, well, 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 yeah, but we all pitched in. And at first it seems like a classic fake-out person is mad, but they're actually happy and it's misconstrued. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's something you need to hear. Thank you for helping my honey. You're welcome. <laughs> but just as suddenly to subvert this, he snaps back into that state of intimidation. My pumpkin is homesick? Maybe I should ask her to come back to kettle corn with me. No! What do you mean, no? And then back into friendly mode. I have no idea what you just said, little feller, but thanks for getting me and Bailey back together. Instead of being a one-track-minded buffoon rival of interest trope, he is surprisingly socially incisive and conscious. Incisive more in terms of effectiveness. And one thing we know about Moose for sure is that it isn't a secret that he's very controlling and wants to keep Bailey in arm's reach. Moose, I'm so glad you're not still mad at me for leaving Kettle Corn. Oh, that's all slop under the trough. I have missed you more than pigs miss their ribs at a barbecue. Fast forward, Bailey and London's car breaks down for an unusually long amount of time. The Corn Goblin attacks, and the next morning it's gone. It's established in the episode that characters can dress up as the Corn Goblin and resemble it quite strikingly. So here's where my theory kind of comes into play. So Moose, knowing that Bailey is on the way, wanting to hatch a deranged plan to get her to stay in Kettle Corn. So you're coming back to Kettle Corn? Heck no! <laughs> knowing that instilling a fear in her going back to the Tipton through the cornfield would help him, leaps onto the car and is like, oh shit, what do I do now? Put a scarecrow there, just run back through the cornfield, get changed, go to meet Bailey and her parents, and make a big appearance that comforts everyone. Everyone, and that's all he has to do because people love him. They adore Moose. Moose is the most revered person in Kettle Corn, Kansas. Then the twister hits. The proximity he can even move away from Bailey is restricted. He's with her in the cellar. Instead of inquiring about what's happening to his home, what's happening outside, he uses this as an opportunity to get Bailey and her family on his side and to have Bailey agree to be in a relationship with him. But once again, he gets full of himself and engages in the nagging and unexpected factor that is Cody Martin's presence. And here he proves to kind of desensitization to putting Bailey in jeopardy by pushing Cody into her by accident and knocking her unconscious. <laughs> And in her dream, Cody is the Tin Man and Moose is the Scarecrow. An apparent comparison to the Tin Man's lack of heart and the Scarecrow's lack of brain. But even more than that, when we cut back to a cornfield and a sentient Scarecrow, one's mind kind of wanders back to when Bailey and London were trapped in a cornfield with a sentient Scarecrow. Or the Corn Goblin, I don't know if it actually is a sentient Scarecrow. Or Moose or a monster that resembles a scarecrow. And if one is to make the corn goblin comparison to Moose, are Bailey's internal concerns about Moose warning her through the language of her fears, or do they speak to something more literal? 
He's deep down emotionally irresponsible and careless, but regardless of lore intention, which probably wasn't for this train of thought to spiral out of control into the Corn Goblin's existence, but still lines up to disprove itself in a textually foundational way, Cody and Moose are an extremely important parallel in the way that their relationship with Bailey represents a very real sense of entitlement. You're always telling me what to do. You think you know what's best for me, but you don't. Fine. I don't need you anyway. Mary Lou has been wanting me to take her to the movies. Moose and his overbearingness and lack of care for Bailey's agency, Cody with his self-pitying nice guy demeanor which ultimately reveals a hostility and spite behind it, is just being possessive in two different ways that are almost equally toxic. The realization they fail to reach for most of the season is that Bailey is just as entitled to her happiness individually as they are to theirs. And instead of the ultimately self-validating experience of finding love for the world and for yourself and your place within it among your friends and your family that you find along the way, a kind of meditation on every piece of life being intimately connected and how the nurturing of our own sense of empathy ties into keeping that in the balance. There's a big world out there filled with awesome experiences, but you can't have any of them if you're just stuck here on this island with a bunch of weird bald dudes. Cody disregards the prospect of his empathy being a valuable tool in navigating the world around him and instead decides to engage with the world through a lens of spite and, and a sense of superiority and eventually she will be sorry. Well, we all know how it turned out. But of course, him learning that empathy is what changes in the end of the series as a whole, in the very final moments of it. Something I didn't get into enough is how Bailey's kind of toxic traits embody a kind of a hostility as well. But as for the subject of this video, I feel like Cody's approach to his relationships embodied a kind of tactful and expandable idea that could last this entire video. One that resembles a very real cautionary tale. Um, Debbie Ryan fandom out.